All right, welcome back, everybody. In a, in a couple of moments, we're going to be joined by a Democratic congressional candidate, Amar Kampanajar, to talk about his uh, crushing his uh, Democratic rival and also uh, the Republican incumbent in fundraising out in California's 50th district this past quarter. What is the better pathway to victory in the general election? And what is a better pathway to raising the funds you need to win a general election and to win a primary election? Is it amassing a, a, a war chest from high net worth individuals, PACs, uh, hiring fundraising consultants, doing a lot of call time? Or is it amassing thousands of small small uh, donors who give in increments of five, fifteen, twenty dollars? Or is it somewhere in between? And if it's in between, what's you know what's the proper balance? the The beauty of this conversation is that we actually have numbers, and we can put some numbers on it uh, right now. The fourth quarter fundraising came out. The D Triple C, in fact, announced some of these results. Uh, Amar raised $176,000, most of it from small donors, in the, in the fourth quarter of 2017. Uh, his, his opponent, Josh Butner, uh, raised 106000 I believe it was. Uh, and far behind both of them is the Republican incumbent, Duncan Hunter, who has spent more money uh, on, on legal bills in 2017 than, than he has raised. Uh, interestingly, when the DCCC announced it, uh, here's their tweet, which you can see here, California 50, at Josh Butner, 107,000, and uh, A. Kampa Najjar, 176. Uh, this is, <laughs> Butner has not been officially endorsed by the party, but is considered to be the National Party's favorite candidate in the race. That's the only explanation for why you would see his name first here, uh, followed by Kampa Najjar. Normally you would say, well, this... He raised 176. Um, Amar, Amar, did you notice this when the when the? Uh, I mean, I saw you tweeted back, um, but did you did you did you notice this when um, the D Triple C flagged the fundraising totals in your race? I did, but I didn't give it too much thought. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's the 750,000 people in my district who are going to vote, and getting support outside of the district from people in the establishment it helps really with just fundraising. But it's not really helping my opponent. Right. I'm working hard. Hunter's hardly working. There was a report that showed that he only got one donation from a voter. Just one. <laughs> one donation. later on today. Yeah. And so guess where I'm going later on today? I'm going to find that one voter. I'm going to pour some salt on that wound. I'm not letting him have even one one donor. So I'm going to go reach out to that person. That's great. Uh, so if, if anybody has questions uh, for Amar, you put them in the comments section or or you can call the number that's in there. Um, so what what is it? What does it what does it say? Were you first of all, were you surprised that with this strategy of uh, small dollars that you were able to outraise the opponent? Because the argument is that, well, maybe small dollars are better, but uh, in like but the total amount that you can get is always going to be better from the wealthy, from from PACs. Um, that, in your case and some others, turned out not to be true. Did that, did that surprise you? Yeah, I was really surprised. Um, but it's really a positive message for me because I've been trying to run this progressive, positive, inclusive campaign, and it's paying off. So by every metric, right, by the establishment's metric, we're winning. We have more cash on hand than Hunter and my opponent. We've outraised them. We've done it with very little, like mainly individual donors. We got one union pack to endorse and give us money. But we've been able to do this through a people-powered movement. So by the establishment's metrics and the progressive's metrics, we're leading. And my hope is to, you know, pave a path towards a unified, fortified, progressive future. And if the establishment wants to play on our terms and they want to give me resources to fight on a platform that expands Medicare for all, ends regime change in the Middle East, has a robust infrastructure uh, plan that is not going to stick it to the middle class but make sure the top earners pay their fair share, ends the most expensive and excessive and burdensome welfare system in America, corporate welfare, and allows us to end Citizens United. If they want to help my campaign do that, they're more than welcome to, but those are the terms in which I'm running my campaign. So if the DCCC is thinking, hey, we, we, we picked the wrong guy and they want to come around and support me, they need to know full well how I'm running and what I'm running on. 
Have you, I mean, you've had a few conversations, I'm sure, with, with the party. How do they respond when, when you say, like, the, no, look, I'm telling you this works. We're building a grassroots army. We're going to, we're going to raise money. It's just a different way of doing it. You know, is it a, just a polite kind of nodding? Or do you think that they're starting to absorb uh, what you and other kind of insurgent candidates around the country are, are, are doing? You know, it's like anything, right? If you're like a lowly staffer in a big organization and you're telling your boss, hey, I saw this, this works, we should go this route, your boss is going to stick to their conventional thinking until you could slowly show them what you're doing. It's actually paying off. It's working. There's utility in this approach. And so I don't really see it as them like snubbing me or being negative or spiteful. It's just they're kind of removed from the process on the ground, right? And that just happens like in the higher echelons of leadership with every institution. And I think they, they, they have their own way of doing things and it's, it's not working. It's a totally failed approach, right? And the status quo has to change, but I think they're receptive to it. Um, obviously they're beholden to different interests than I am. So it's a tougher conversation for them, but I'm freed up. I mean, I'm not taking any money from big oil or big corporations or massive donors. So I'm kind of freed up to say what I think will serve the interests of my district. And look, the district hasn't been flipped in decades. And if the establishment knew how to do it, they would have done it already. So I think they're they're really hungry for an alternative kind of approach to trying to flip this district and, and turning it blue. And you recently won in California what's known as a pre-endorsement. You, in order to get the pre-endorsement, you had to win at least 80% of the delegates uh, uh, last week or so, and you won 97% of them, which which more or less assures that the state party is eventually going to endorse. Um, if that happens, do you expect that the national party will ask the other Democrats in the race to step aside so that uh, the election isn't isn't spoiled? And and I, uh, so for our non-California listeners, um, Ex- explain briefly the the way that the primary system works there. Yeah, it's a, it's a, the top two vote getters, right? So it could be two Republicans could advance from the primary. Two Democrats can. It's unlikely that two Democrats will advance, but it could happen where two Republicans do advance. It, it has happened too before, many right? Democrats on one side. Yeah, and it's happened before, and that's a huge concern. The forty ninth, because there's about six of them. There's three Democrats on our side, and look, if you have two Republicans advance. It's going to be the first time in a generation that a Democrat doesn't take on the Hunter dynasty at its weakest period. I mean, it would be a shame on us. The gates of hell would be locked on the inside if we didn't do something about this. So I hope the party, you know, tries to build consensus uh, around the consensus candidate. And by every metric, 97 percent of the delegates voted for us. That's in a sweet way race, right? We've outraised Hunter. We've outraised the opponent. We have more cash on hand. Let's learn from this past election cycle. This is a contrast election cycle. When you see Alabama turning blue because the African-American women vote turned out, well, we could do the same thing in this district. When Danica beat Bob Marshall, Danica, who was a transgender woman who beat the guy who authored the bathroom ban, it's a contrast election cycle. And I got contrast with Hunter, not just my hues, but my views. And I think it's the issues I'm running on that's going to help us win. So let me give you a, uh, a skeptical comment from uh, one viewer who says, uh, Amar, he says, Amar doesn't stand a chance against Butner in California 50. It's a super rural, right-leaning district. Butner might have a chance against Hunter, but all the money in the world won't elect a guy named Amar in California 50. Not trying to be negative. That's just how they roll in the 50. Visit it and find out. That's from a, a viewer named John Williams, um, who's who who thinks that. And I, I assume by uh, a guy named Amar, he thinks that your ethnicity is going to get in the way of in, in this district. You, you want to take that on? Yeah, I mean, so it's it's a it's a fair you know concern from based on conventional thinking, but it's totally out of touch with reality. And I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, I've been going to a lot of rural areas. I live in Hamul, first of all. But I've also gone to Lakeside, the Lakeside Rodeo. I've talked to conservatives there. I went to a bar in Ramona, the oldest bar called the Turkey Inn. There is literally a shrine of Trump inside that bar. Outside that bar is a sign that says a more camp in a jar. Because we talked about the issues. I talked about how, you know, when, when, when they're gone, someone has to fight for their kids. When the worst kinds of climate change hit, when 
uh, education system that leads to good paying jobs, when we inherit soul crushing debt, someone needs to fight for their kids' futures. And that resonates with people. Above and beyond that, we've actually had a Navy SEAL who ran 10 years ago against Duncan Hunter. And he lost worse than the guy who ran last year who only had $27,000 to his name in the whole cycle. And on top of that, there's a study that came out where about 100 Democratic veterans have been uh, nominated in the past couple years. And only one has been a Republican incumbent because she was a progressive. I think if you're going to run on the military background in a district like ours, you have to be a progressive who could keep your base and then try to sway people on the other side. Otherwise, conservatives are going to say, look, I'm going to go for him. Keep in mind, this is a district that voted for a guy who was in jail, Duke Cunningham, over a Democrat, only because there was no appealing thing on the other side. And so what I'm offering is a guy who is running, working hard, 700 volunteers. And look, the district's 35% Latino. It's 15% Middle Eastern. It's half me. I'm not running to be the candidate for brown people. But we need those people to carry us over to 51%. And I know we could do it. There's four campuses in my district. There's a lot of young people. If we turn out young people, minorities, women, lifelong Democrats, and even those Trump supporters who voted for Obama and Trump, they're not ignorant. They're ignored. And we talk about working class issues. I know we're going to win. That's why we got 97% of the California Democratic Party's endorsement. That's why we've gotten every county club endorsement. That's why we've outraised Hunter and Josh. And I just don't think he creates a contrast enough to Hunter to pull this off. On your supporters, uh, that's the next question that somebody has. Uh, it says, what's the makeup of your donations and energy? Uh, DSA, young people, regular people, unions, et cetera. Like, how do you, what, what is the makeup of your, of your base and your backers? Yeah, it, it really varies, right? I have a lot of people in the district. They've had, like, small dollar fundraisers at wineries and in Ramona and in Escondido and El Cajon. And then I've had, you know, some fundraising outside the district because it's a national office. You have to do that. You know, some Middle Eastern folks, some Latinos, but people from the Jewish community, it's as diverse as our country and our county and our district. And it's really just making a compelling case. A lot of these people are first time donors. They're going to be first time voters. So to address that other guy's question, how are we going to win? It's creating that enthusiasm and expanding the electorate. Right now, the most electable guy is Duncan Hunter, unless we expand the electorate like we did in Wisconsin and Alabama and Virginia and New Jersey. If we do the same thing we've done before, we're going to get more of the same. We've had that profile run before against Hunter. They do worse than non-veterans, not because veterans can't serve. I got veterans in my own family. There's a guy who's serving in the 49th who is a great guy, but he's progressive. If you're a moderate running in our district, you're going to lose the base, and you won't be able to appeal to Republicans because you have a D next to your name. Right. you got to be a progressive. Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe this will be the last one. Uh, I know you got to run. Uh, Lauren, Lauren Perrine says, uh, how are you getting your name out there? Are you getting pushback when you're trying to access resources from the party? No, not anymore. Now that there's a mandate and, you know, I talk to people and I tell them, look, I wouldn't be the first skinny brown guy with a funny name sent to Washington. Right. And we have, you know, and I remember before we were feeling the burn, before we were starting together, we were all fired up and ready to go. And this president didn't do everything I wanted him to do personally. I was against TPP and a couple other uh, parts of the president's agenda. But I do remember a time when we were all unified. Right. And I think I'm calling for that message of unity. And people care. People like about the issues, right, in my district. And when I tell them, look, Amar, they have these, they're these signs people are making, yes, we campa, uh, join the campa campaign, in Spanish, votar para Amar, ways for people to remember my name. There are people putting up signs in their houses, like on their windows. People are getting the word out. And when you have one guy, one person vote, uh, donating to Hunter in the district and a whole bunch of others voting for us and donating to us, it speaks volumes about the contrast of the kind of campaign I'm running against Hunter. And it's not just because of me. You know, this election is about, I tell people, it's about you and me becoming an unstoppable we against adversity and corruption and greed. And people are connecting to this. It's not even about me. It stopped being about me a long time ago. My team has this saying where you come for Amar, but you stay for each other. This has quickly outgrown me as a person. I'm just a steward of this story 
of this movement, this populist uprising in my district. And people don't have to know how to pronounce my name. They just have to pick it out in the ballot. So as long as we have them do that, we'll be okay. Uh, okay, this is really the last question. Um, Max, Max Simpkins, this isn't exactly a question, but I wanted to give you a chance to tell uh, viewers who might not know who Duncan Hunter is a little bit about who your Republican opponent would be. He, he says, this is how he puts it, he said, Duncan Hunter is a terrible bro who also can't even manage to keep his own kids from wasting campaign money on Steam games. Um, what t- tell tell folks what he's referring to, um, and, and and a little bit about your your opponent. Yeah, I don't spend too much time trying to attack him on those grounds, but he spent about sixty thousand dollars of his campaign funds on personal expenses, like trips to Rome and his kids' school and Versace clothing and all this stuff, which is all illegal, by the way. And there's more to it. There's actually more. Like he, some business was subpoenaed because. There's more spending that was questionable. He's had to spend over half a million dollars from his campaign war chest on legal fees. So that's why he has less cash on hand mm-hmm. than I do. But more than his mismanaging of campaign funds, his mismanaging of taxpayer money is what's driving me and a lot of people in my district insane. This is a guy who refuses to put the 50th first. He talks tough talk about North Korea to appease Trump, knowing that our district is in striking distance. So why provoke North Korea? He knows, he said himself, that this tax bill would hurt California. He literally said that on Uh TV. He He fully acknowledges that. And then he says, but it's going to help the rest of the country, you know, like his donors. It's going to help enrich his donors that then enrich him by illegally using his money. And then he talks about a wall. Even the conservatives in my district hate the idea of the wall because we already have a wall in California. Why are Californians going to pay more taxes for a wall in Texas and Arizona. These are folks who care about state rights and state autonomy. Why on earth is California going to pay for a wall, by the way, that won't work? Wall stopped working the, mo- the moment America built airplanes. I thought uh, me- I thought Mexico was paying for that wall anyway. Sorry? I thought Mexico was supposed to be paying for that wall anyway. <clears throat> yeah, that, see, he broke his campaign promise a long time ago. We should, instead of trying to build a wall, rebuild the middle class, build up working families, take that $25 billion and invest it in tuition-free college and vocational training and rebuild the middle class. He has betrayed. Trump and Hunter have betrayed their own voters, their own donors. It's time that they do the same and betray them and jump on the camp of campaign and pave a path towards a unified future where everybody gets a fair shot. That's what we need in this district. And I'm really just tired of the antics and the distraction that Trump is doing. Like right now, we're talking about Russia and everything else. We have to reclaim the narrative from Trump. We can't just react to him. We can't just be the opposition party. We have to be the opportunity party that fights for Medicare for all and immigration rights and the working class and just making sure that we're doing the right thing by people. Look, every day people are working hard. We should do the same thing for them. We should serve them as well as they serve us. And that's not happening in Washington, not under Hunter. Great. Amar Kampanajar, uh, running in the 50th District in California. Thanks so much for joining us. Welcome back anytime. Uh, good luck with the rest of your race. I appreciate it. Thanks. I got fired up there. I apologize. <laughs> nah, fired up is good.